excited to be up here and uh, bring in the word to you guys. This message was supposed to happen last week, um, and I was kind of going to, uh, what I'm going to do today is give an extension of Pastor Terry's message from a few weeks ago, a message that he preached called Roadblocks. And the whole idea of, of that message was to deal with some of the things that get in our way when it comes to growing, when it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to maturing in our faith. And so he, he talked about a lot of problems that day that many of us experience as we want to grow. And I'm going to focus on one particular problem that I think many of us are hindered by uh, as we walk this life of, of faith, as we try to follow Jesus. This is the one thing that I think we have all struggled with that we have probably all fallen victim to, and it's this. We all have feelings. We all have emotions. We all have, have certain thoughts. And here's what I mean. The title of today's message is this, In My Feelings. There's a, there's a great philosopher of our generation. He wrote a song one time, and it was called In My Feelings. And, uh, and some of y'all know who I'm talking about and anyway. Um, so what I mean by feelings is this. We all have thoughts. We all have certain emotions. We all have certain habits that we have. And these feelings that we have have taken us farther away from God's plan for our life. And let me prove it to you. Many of us have probably thought or said something very similar to what I'm about to say. I don't really feel like reading my Bible today. Maybe you didn't say that out loud. Maybe you thought it. Maybe you're like, ah, I, I had a long day today. God would understand. I had a really long day. I feel tired. I don't feel like reading my Bible today. Or, or maybe you thought to yourself, it was Sunday morning. You woke up. I used to do this when I was a kid. My mom would, would wake up or super early, and, 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 and she would make us go to church every Sunday, and I didn't want to go. And so if she was still sleeping, my brother and I would, would stay in bed, stay in our rooms as quiet as possible because we didn't feel like going to church that day. And, and if we woke up, we would wake up mom and then she would make us go and we didn't want to. But many of us have probably said some things very similar to that. So we're gonna deal with this today. And, and like I said, it's not just these ideas like I don't feel like doing this, it's our emotions. Do any of you guys have emotions in here? Do any of you guys feel things? Because I do. And oftentimes the things that I feel and the emotions that I have are not the things that God wants for my life. I don't know if you've ever experienced that where you thought something or you felt something and you're like, that is actually probably not the best thought. If I did that, I would probably end up farther away from where God is calling me to be. So we're gonna look um, at the scripture today like we do because we're at church. And um, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, if you got your phone on you, um, you can open up you version. And I'm trusting that you're not texting during, during my preaching. So um, I'll be watching. Um, Luke chapter 22, we're gonna pick up in verse 39. And let me, set the con let me set the context for you. This is right after Jesus has eaten the Passover meal with the disciples. This is the last Passover, and he is about to make his way to the cross and make the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. And, and, and he has this dinner. He, he takes communion with the disciples. He tells them what's about to happen. He says, listen, you guys are going to be the, the, the foundation for this next era of the church. This is what's gonna happen. He has this dinner, he tells them what's to come, and then Jesus, like he always does, goes off to pray. He goes to this place called the Mount of Olives, and we're actually gonna pick up in verse 41. It says this, and Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw. I don't know how far you guys can throw a rock, but that was about as far as he went. And he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. This cup that he's talking about is, is what he's about to endure. You guys have probably all heard the story of Jesus going to the cross, being beaten, being spit on, being um, hurt, in pain, carrying a cross up a hill, being crucified. That was all about to come and he knew exactly what was going to happen. And he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Now here is, is I wanna focus on this for a second because many of us don't actually believe that, that Jesus was human, right? We know that he was human, but but we don't actually like believe that he was human. Jesus actually experienced things like you and I experienced. He had real emotions and he had real feelings. I would imagine that Jesus actually felt something about this particular time in his life. He said, Father, if there is any other way, let's do that. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to, maybe, he, he knew what the plan was and he knew that he had to do it, but inside he was saying to himself, this is not comfortable. I don't want to do this, but then he makes a statement that many of us probably would never make in our lifetime. He has feelings, he has thoughts, he has emotions about what's to come, and he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And now an angel from heaven, after he said that, appeared to him, strengthening him. 
And being in agony, this is how we know Jesus actually felt something. Being in agony, he was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Now, I don't know if you've ever been so stressed out, so worked up that you were just a sweaty mess and your, your sweat was like drops of blood just falling to the ground. I was at the fair on Friday. It was really, really hot outside and my shirt I was wearing like a light blue shirt, and you know when you're wearing like light clothing, you can see all the sweat that's just like breaking through. You, you lift your arm up, you got the, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. My whole back was just like a puddle. Like it was disgusting. But, uh, but, but picture this. Jesus is praying in this garden in agony for what is about to come. He has thoughts and feelings that, that he doesn't want to go through with this. He says, God, please, if there's any other way, let's do that instead, but not my will, Yours be done. And that's the part that a lot of us miss out on. We experience things, we feel things, we have emotions, we have anger, we have anxiety, and we don't give them to God. We don't say, God, I know this is what I'm feeling, but this is what you're saying. Many of us take our feelings and count that as truth. And, and, and that's really what I'm talking about today is there's this idea, this diabolical idea that whatever I feel is true. You guys have seen it all over social media. You've probably had conversations with people that they say things like, you know what, this is, this is just how I feel and, and, and that's my truth. That's true for me. Because I've experienced it, that means it must be right. And may, maybe you've had thoughts like that. Maybe you know somebody that's had thoughts like that. But this is the true life that we're living in right now. People equate their feelings, their opinions to fact and to truth. But that's actually not the case. So, um, as we read down further in Luke chapter 22, I wanna show you somebody who had some thoughts, who had some feelings, um, and, and those feelings actually took him farther away from God's purpose for his life. And maybe you guys have heard of this guy called Peter in the Bible, pretty, pretty well-known guy. Um, at the Passover meal that Jesus had eaten with the disciples, Peter was there, and, and he said something very significant to Jesus. He had this, like, this church camp high. He was ready to do anything for Jesus. He was ready to live for Jesus. He said, Jesus, wherever you go, I will go with you. If you're gonna die, I'm gonna die with you. If you go to prison, I will go to prison with you, Jesus. I promise you this. And Jesus told him something very opposite of that. He said, actually, Peter, before a rooster crows tonight, you're gonna deny me three times. And Peter said, Lord, no, it could never be. Not me. I would never do that. But we find out in Luke chapter 22, verse 54, this is what's happening. Having arrested Jesus, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. After they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, this man was with him too. This man was with Jesus. This man was part of Jesus' crew. And Peter, who just a few verses prior said, Lord, wherever you go, I will follow you. Peter said, woman, I do not know him. A little later, another saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. Second time he denies Jesus. And after about an hour had passed, another man began to insist saying, certainly this man also was with him for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Here we have two examples, Jesus who probably wanted to follow his feelings, who said, God, if there's any other way, let's do that. Not my will, but yours be done, so I'll do it anyway. And then we have Peter over on this side, says, Lord, I'll die with you. I'll go to prison with you. I'll do whatever it takes to just be with you. And then a few verses later, when circumstances change, when life changes, when things get hard, when life is uncomfortable, he says, you know what, actually, the things that I thought and the things that I felt are, are no longer valid because, because what I'm experiencing right now is scary. It's hard. I don't want to go through with it. So you know what? My feelings are going to take me this way. And he said, God, I don't even know who that is. I don't know who Jesus is. That guy, I haven't been hanging out with him, not for the last three years. Couldn't be me. That was what Peter was saying because of his feelings told him, don't do this, Peter. It's going to hurt. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be uncomfortable. You don't want to do this. And he succumbed to the feelings that he had. And I'd imagine that many of us have probably done very similar things. Maybe we feel prompted by God to go and do something, to go talk to somebody, and then all of a sudden the little voice in our head creeps in and it says, you don't wanna do that. You don't, you don't wanna do what God's calling you to do, it's gonna hurt. 
People are probably gonna think you're dumb. That's not the cool thing to do. Your friends don't wanna talk about God with you. All these thoughts and feelings we begin to have and then we count them as truth. And that's the real problem because I'm not saying that our feelings and our emotions are bad. I have them all the time, okay? I get happy, I get sad, I get angry. Those things aren't bad. But what's bad is when we count those things as truth, as fact, as gospel when they're not. The only truth is Jesus. So if we are saying anything else is truth then we're actually wrong, that's false. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. So before we get into this, Let's pray, and then uh, we'll really break this down a little bit more. So God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you're wanting to do in the lives of each individual person. God, I thank you for um, people who have been here before, people who have never stepped foot in here before, and they're here today. God, I ask that you would speak to each person individually. And God, I pray if this is something that we struggle with, that you would strengthen our hearts this morning, God, that you would persuade us to believe in you again, that you would give us a new sense of faith today. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna ask you guys this question. Have you ever found yourself doing something that you swore you would never do? Have you ever done something that you were like, I will never be that person. I will never be that guy. Is anybody parents in here? Do anybody have kids? A few of y'all have kids. I remember when my wife was pregnant with my first child, uh, Ellie. Many of you guys know Ellie. Um, as, as we were, you know, as Kinsey was pregnant, you get nine months to just kind of talk about what life's gonna be like as parents. And a lot of us make statements just like this. You know, when I'm a parent, I'm never gonna do that. My child is never gonna watch TV. You know what I mean? Any y'all ever said something like that before? And then, then the child comes and, and the first few months are nice and easy, you know, they don't do much, they don't move around a whole lot, they don't really make you very angry, but... But, but then they start moving around, they start crawling, they start doing all sorts of things. And then the very thing that you swore you wouldn't do as a parent, you know, my mom always did this to me. I'm never gonna do that, you know. You start doing the exact same thing that your parents did to you and that their grandparents did to them, you know what I mean? And so all of a sudden your kid's now watching four hours of TV every day because you're like, I just can't deal with it today. I know I swore I would never do this. But you know what, Blippi is way more entertaining than I am to my kids. Or, or, or here's, if I have to listen to another Coco Melon song, I'm actually gonna lose my mind, and that is not a lie. I actually read this thing about Coco Melon that it's like, it's like super like immersive for babies. I don't know what it is, but it's weird. I don't like it, the little characters are weird. But anyway, there's so many things that we swore we would never do. Now as parents, we're doing the very things. And how embarrassing is it to say something like that? Like, you know, if you see a kid crying in Walmart, you're like, oh, my kid would never. And then, and then I will never forget the first time that Ellie threw a massive tantrum inside of Target. We had walked in the doors, okay? She could walk at this point in time. And we walked in the doors. We were excited. We're like, yeah, we're going to Target today. It's gonna be a really great day. And as a parent, those great days maybe don't happen as often as you'd like them to happen. And so we get into Target and, and Ellie's excited and she's running in and I'm holding her hand. And as we get like, I don't know, 20 steps inside the doorway. Ellie's like, I've had enough, let's go back outside, okay? So she tries to turn around and run back outside and I tried to be quick, you know, I grabbed her hand, I'm like, hey, we're not going outside right now, we're gonna go shopping, and then we'll go back to the car. I don't know how much she understood, she was like nine months old, okay? So I grab her by the hand, I start dragging her along a little bit and then the tantrum happens and it's every parent's worst nightmare. You're in the middle of Target and you're like, oh my God. Gosh, what she is screaming as loud as she can. I actually posted a picture of it. I took a picture. She was laying on the floor crying, and my first instinct was to actually pull out my phone and <laughs> document the moment. Like, hey, this is gonna be good later on. So I posted it on Instagram, and, and I actually got quite a few mean comments from it. I remember somebody was like, you know, if you raise your child with a belt, those things will never happen. That's bad parenting. And I'm like, you can't control it. Like, they're gonna cry, okay? They're gonna... They're gonna embarrass you. They're gonna do things you don't want them to do. And, and though you swore you would never be the parent with their child crying in the middle of Target, here you are. Here you are. And I wanna, I wanna tell you one more story of a time that uh, I did something that I swore I would never do. I've, have all of you guys like grown up here? Anybody grown up here in Hermiston, Oregon? Um, okay, we got a few people, local people, right? Um, there's this thing that they do at the county fair and I didn't really realize that this is what the fair was all about, but they like show animals, there's livestock, there's all these exhibits, there's, that's really what the fair is about. But you know, as I was growing up, I was like, 
oh, the fair, that's like where we get, you know, like elephant ears and funnel cake and I go ride rides till I throw up. Like, that's what the fair was for me, okay? I, I, I grew up just kind of, you know, I would say I was like a city boy because I, I, I wasn't like a country boy, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't associate with that. Now, fast forward to my sophomore year in high school, I start dating this girl who's now my wife and, and she actually grew up in a family that raised livestock. That was like cows, pigs, sheep, chickens, all the things, right? Kinsey, that, like, that was Kinsey's life. She, she loved doing those things, still loves doing those things. And our junior year in high school comes around and she goes, Austin, you know what we should do? And I'm like, go to Chipotle? I don't know, like what, are, like, what do you wanna do? And she's like, you should show a, show a pig with me in the county fair. I'm like, Sh- show a, show a, like show and tell a pig? Like what? <laughs> What, what does it mean to show a pig? Like, I don't understand. That's like bacon? Like, that's what we're talking about. And she's like, yeah, you, you show a pig, you raise a pig, you get them, you raise them, you train them a little bit, and you show them at the county fair, and then you sell them for money. And in my brain, I'm like so lost because, first of all, if you know me, you know like, like, I, like I don't do that kind of, like I don't get dirty, I don't like to get nat. Pigs are disgusting, okay? The grossest animal there ever was. And Kinsey's walking around in the pig poop all barefoot. Like, that was how she grew up, okay? That's not what I did. That's, not what I, that's why she didn't get COVID, and I did, because she was immune, you know? Um, so this is something that growing up, I'm like, I will never participate in things like that, like cowboy things. And I'm not trying to make fun of anybody, but, like, that's how I viewed it. I was like, that's country. That is not me, okay? And, you know, what do you do for young love? You, you say yes to the girlfriend who asked you to show a picture and you show a pig. And so we go get pigs, we pick them up, they're cute at first because they're all little, and then they turn into these massive 300 pound animals, and you're like, if this thing steps on my foot, I'm done. Like, it's, it's huge, okay? And so we go to the county fair, we show the pigs, but the problem was at the county fair that um, I didn't quite dress the part. You know what I mean? Like, like boots, button up, cowboy, like this is what like I wear, okay? Like these are like skater shoes, like, you know, some skinny jeans, a t-shirt, like that's what I wear, okay? So I had to go buy an entirely new outfit just to show a pig in because you couldn't show it in basketball shorts and like Nike socks, like you just, that wasn't okay. So, so I did it, you know, I bought a shirt, I borrowed a belt buckle, I wore somebody else's boots because I didn't have any and my jeans weren't boot cut. So I was like trying to shove the cowboy boots inside my pants and it looked like I had shoved like cups inside my pants because they were just like expanding and my skinny jeans couldn't handle it. But anyway, I will say this though, not to get too off topic, there's a competition inside of this all. There's something called oral reasons where you have to like judge a class of livestock and I didn't grow up doing that stuff. Like I don't know nothing about pigs. You have to like judge it based on like their body parts, like the cuts of the animal and, and all those things, right? And you go in front of a judge and you say, hey, I'm voting this class, you know, one, two, three, four for these reasons. I knew nothing, nothing. So I go in front of this judge and I'm like freaking out on the inside. And I, t- I, I give my reasons. I'm like, judge, I like pig number one because he's got a, a big butt and I think that means bacon or like, you know, all those things, okay? Like that's what I'm saying to this judge. And turns out, turns out that I was actually like the third highest scorer in this whole area. And my wife was like down in the hundreds, okay? Like I outscored my wife in this thing that I swore that I would never do. Yeah, you can clap it up for that. That's, that's impressive. Good job, Austin. Anyway, I found myself doing something that I swore I would never, ever do. And I wonder how many of us have found ourselves in a place just like that, there's this thing, the human condition. We, we say things like, I'll, I'll, I'll never do that. I'll, I'll, I'll never not follow God. God, I will go anywhere with you. I'll go to prison and I'll die with you, Jesus. And then, and then you find yourself in a place saying, I don't know if I can follow through. My, my, my feelings are too strong right now. The things that I'm experiencing are, are far outweighing the benefits of what I thought I had. And, and all of a sudden, our feelings turn into truth. And they take us farther and farther away from the plan that God actually has for our life. And so the question I wanna ask you this morning is this, are you willing to lay down your feelings and submit them to God? How can we follow God and his plan rather than submit 
to our feelings because that's what we're doing. Every time we say yes to our feelings and no to God, we're submitting to one or the other. The Bible says that we cannot serve two masters. So this is a choice between one master or the other. We're submitting to one or the other. So I wanna explore today, how can we submit our lives to God and our feelings to God rather than submitting to our feelings? So I wanna give you guys a few points. We'll break it down and then we'll get out of here. So point number one is this. We have to understand that our feelings lie to us. Our emotions lie to us. Sometimes our thoughts lie to us. Did you guys know that there, there, there's, there's God and there's heaven and there's the Holy Spirit that speaks to us, but there's actually a whole other spectrum. There, there, there's Satan and there's demons and there's all these crazy things and, and there's these voices inside of our head that are also talking to us, so it's not too far off to assume that we might hear things that don't sound like us, that we might feel things that don't feel like us um, and, and because our feelings lie to us. Jeremiah 17, nine says this, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? One of the worst pieces of advice that we can give to people, maybe, maybe a graduating senior, they might ask you for a piece of advice and you say, hey champ, buddy, hey, you know what? Just follow your heart, man. Just follow your heart. Like, I, like, th like, like this, like who can even define the heart? I don't even know, scholars and theologians alike have tried to define what the heart is for centuries. And, and, and still there's so many different varying things as to what it is. How can we understand it? The answer is we can't. You can't. The only one who knows the heart is the one who made it. So you and I will never be able to understand our feelings, be able to understand the things that, that are going on inside of us because they were never meant to lead us. Our feelings were never meant to take us from point A to point B. Jesus was, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us to guide us. It was never meant to be anything else. Nobody can, can, can agree and, and understand with the heart. And let me prove to you that our feelings lie to us. I already proved it to you a little bit, but I wanna prove it to you just a little bit more. Um, if I followed my feelings every day of the week, let me tell you something. I would be probably 30 pounds heavier because I would be eating McDonald's every meal, Taco Bell, McDonald's, whatever it is. Like if, if I followed what I felt, I would probably be fat, number one, and I would be broke. Well, I'm already broke, so I can't say that one. But, but I, I would probably be like 30 pounds heavier because how much easier is it to just go to the drive-thru and get food there and then go back to work and, and not have to worry about cooking meals and, and go grocery shopping and all that stuff? If I followed my feelings, that's where I would be. Maybe you said something like this. I don't really feel like working out today. Um, many of us have probably had gym memberships for months and have never went to the gym. I've done that before. I paid for like a year-long membership and then like went twice, okay? Because I just didn't feel like working out, okay? Because our feelings lie to us, right? We know working out is good for us, but we don't do it. We know eating healthy is good for us, but we don't do it. Even when we can't taste or smell, we still don't eat healthy, okay? There's something wrong with that one. Um, maybe you said to yourself, I don't really feel like going to work today. Um, if I didn't go to work, I would be fired from my job. And many of you are probably in the same boat. You know, uh, maybe you said something like, I don't really feel like praying today. All the things that we think are, are healthy in our life, for some reason, we never have the desire to do them. And sometimes we wake up and we have a good day and we're like, yeah, I'm gonna be productive today. I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna read my Bible. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna have a great day at work. I'm gonna eat healthy. I already meal prepped for the week. But, but oftentimes it feels like those days are, are, are the, the lesser. And, and the days where it's like, it would just be easier to, to go to McDonald's, to not go to the gym, to, to skip out on, on, on meal prepping and, and sit on the couch and watch Netflix and, and go on Facebook and go on TikTok because it just feels better. Okay, that's how I know our feelings lie to us because my feelings are always telling me to do something that's not good for me. And not all the time, like I said, feelings aren't bad, emotions aren't bad, but most of the time, the things that I feel are leading me farther away from what's good for me. And let me give you more evidence. Paul writes something in Romans chapter seven that really defines the human condition. He says this, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do want is what I keep on doing. Have you ever felt like Paul before? Like, you know what you want to do, but inevitably, and, and after enough time goes by, you'll catch me doing the very thing that I said I wouldn't do. I said I would never be the parent inside Target that has their kid laying on the floor crying, but, but there I was, 
I said I would never be the guy that shows a pig at the county fair, but, but there I was. The human condition is so fickle. It's, it's so circumstantial. It's so dependent on the things that are happening around us. That's why we cannot follow our feelings. Our natural tendencies always, always, always seem to pull us towards evil and not towards good, not towards the things of God, not towards the things that he has in our life. Our heart and our feelings wanna convince us that our way is ultimately better than God's way. And we know that's not true. If you've ever tried to live life in your own, if you've ever walked away from Jesus, you've probably experienced what it means to, to live life your own way and to fall and to fail and to falter and all those things. I know I've experienced that before. Every time I try to go off on my own and do the things that I think are right, I end up falling flat on my face every single time. All that to say our feelings mislead us. Satan has loved, loved, loved using our feelings, using our opinions, using our thoughts to, to not only cause us to be um, um, disunified with one another, but to, but to lead us individually farther away from where God is calling us to. I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but this movement of the my truth, that what I feel, it's right. If I feel like this, therefore it must be true. My feelings are valid. Many of us, are, we, we just, we cannot have a conversation with somebody without them saying something like, hey, you invalidated me and that's, that's not okay, actually. What I'm feeling is valid. What I'm feeling is okay. What I'm feeling is true because I've experienced it. And the problem is, the reason that our, our, our feelings are so prevalent in today's day and age, this is point number two, that we allow our feelings to speak louder than the truth. We allow our feelings to be the loudest voice inside of our head at any given moment. It's, it's, it's always, hey, I feel this, and then kind of in the back, you're like, oh, but I should do this. I feel like going to McDonald's. Oh, Austin, you should have been meal prepping all week. Oh, I, I want to go to the gym, but I didn't sleep long enough tonight, so I'm going to sleep in. Like These are the things that we're experiencing because our feelings speak louder than the truth in our lives. And, and, and the question is, how do we combat that? How do we say, you know what, this voice is loud and, and this voice is quiet, but let me tell you this. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we destroy, every, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised in the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So our job, one job that we have as Christians, and if you're not a Christian, this is a good look into how we can deal with these things. Uh, our job is to take the thoughts that we have the feelings that we have, and make them obedient to Jesus. Make them submit to God. Now, that might sound weird or super hyper-spiritual, but it's actually a really easy exercise. When we, we have to have a thought, so we have to be aware of what's happening inside of our brain. We have to say, hey, Austin, I know that, that you want to go to McDonald's for lunch today, but, but two things, um, you don't have the money for that, so it wouldn't be a wise decision. This is me being aware of my thoughts. And, and, and number two, it's not really great for you. So, so maybe instead of that, let's take this thought that I'm having and, and, and line it up with, with the scripture. The scripture tells me my body is a temple. I need to take care of it, right? And, and that, that my finances are actually a resource that I have in the kingdom of God. So, so I should spend those wisely and spend those according to what God is calling me to do. And when I'm taking them somewhere else, I'm actually wasting what God is calling me to do. So I'm taking this thought that I have and I'm submitting it to the scripture, right? But here's where a lot of us go wrong. In order to take our thoughts, our feelings, the things we're experiencing and submit them to Jesus and make them obedient to him, we have to know the truth. We have to know what the scripture says. And the saddening statistic is that I would imagine about 90% of proclaimed Christians haven't opened their Bibles in the last probably six months to a year. There is no way that we can take our thoughts captive and submit them to Jesus if we don't even know the truth that we are supposed to measure them up against. Okay, the Bible is like a ruler and we, we take it to measure it with what our life is looking like. If, if, if there's something in my life that goes wrong, I open the Bible and I say, okay, what, what, what do I need to fix? What do I need to change? How do I need to adjust the sales a little bit? Like this is my instruction manual, the Bible is, okay? But many of us don't know the Bible. We don't know the truth inside of it. So we will never be able to submit our thoughts and submit our feelings to it. And I wanna show you guys uh, what this looks like, okay? Um, I have over here a, a little glass pitcher full of ping pong balls, right? And these ping pong balls are, are going to represent our feelings. They're gonna represent our thoughts. Maybe this one is like, 
I want to go to McDonald's for lunch today. Maybe this one is, I don't want to go to the gym today. And, and this one is, I don't really feel like treating my family with respect today, even though I, I know I should, but I've had a bad day, so I don't have to. And, and this one is, I don't want to read my Bible. I'm going to actually scroll through TikTok for an hour. And, and there's all sorts of thoughts and feelings that we have in our mind. And, and this is what many of us who don't read our Bible look like. We're full of all these thoughts, all these feelings that are ready to take us farther and farther away from God's plan for our life. This is what it looks like inside of our head, right? They're not ping pong balls, okay? You just got thoughts and words circulating in there, okay? But, but what happens is every time you open the Bible, you start to get filled up with the truth. You start to, oh, dear God, I hope this works. Okay, the, the ball's moved. That was close. I didn't think it was gonna work for a second. But when we start to open our Bible, the, the, the truth of God's word actually infiltrates us and all those thoughts and feelings that we were experiencing now start to come out and we start to measure them into scripture and... and, and You're like, hey, you know what? Actually, that thought isn't measuring up with Christ. That thought isn't what God would want me to do. And and we can know that because we actually can see the truth. When we read the Bible, we know the truth. Therefore, the thoughts are not valid anymore. The thoughts that we once thought were true in our lives, the thoughts that we we once had and said, this is fact, this is truth, this is gospel, we're now realizing that, oh, I was was actually wrong about those things. And, And now you have the tools in your belt to handle those situations. But Here's the thing, many of us might read the Bible once a week and say, hey, that's good enough for me. You know, I still got some things, but that's good enough for me. I'm still gonna treat people in my life badly. I'm still gonna gonna spend my money terribly because I haven't read, you know, a lot of the scripture. And I've only read it like once a week, but here's the thing. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing continually, okay? So the more you read your Bible, the more that you pray, the more that you come to church, the more that you worship, the more that you do those things, you're all of a sudden filled up with something other than the thoughts and the feelings that are inside your head. And, 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 at, and at a moment, what happens is now you're filled up with the truth. You're filled up with the word. This is what you want your life to look like. So that way when a thought does come, when, when something does penetrate your mind, it can't go anywhere else besides the surface. And, and, and when that thought comes from the outside, you grab it and you say, you know what? This is not the thought that I wanna follow. So it's just sitting on the surface. It can't go any deeper because you are so full of God that these bad thoughts and these things from Satan that wanna take you away physically cannot do that. They have to sit on the surface. They have to stay right here because you're gonna take them and you're gonna say, you know what? This is what I want to do. But I don't have to do that anymore because I'm not a slave. I don't want to treat my family well today because I've had a bad day. But you know what? The Holy Spirit empowers me so I can just toss that out. This is, I want to spend my money on the latest PS5. But you know what? God has told me that my resources are important and I should spend them on the kingdom things so I can just get rid of that thought. And then maybe this one is the McDonald's lunch that I wanted to have today. But you know what? My body is a temple. So we're going to get rid of that one too. And all of a sudden, all you're left with is God. The Holy Spirit is, is, is in you and you are full. When you are full, nothing else can go inside of you. The problem is that so many of us are writing empty week to week that, that when a thought comes in, we grasp onto it. We're like, oh, this has to be truth because there, that there's something that I need inside of me and I don't have. Oh, there's another one and, and I need it because I don't have anything else inside of me. But when you're already full... You don't have to grasp onto just things flying around you. When when a thought comes into your mind, you don't have to even give it a second glance because you know it's not true. A lot of people, when it comes to studying other religions and and, and studying apologetics, they they say things like, it's it's important to study the other, the scriptures. So, So for example, if you are wanting to study apologetics, you might look at something like the Book of Mormon or the Quran, so that way you can fight the arguments that they might have against you. But what's actually more important than that and knowing what the Quran says is knowing what the Bible says. Because when you know the truth, you know what's a lie. When, when, when you know what the scripture says is fact, anything else that tries to enter that that doesn't line up with that has to leave. So you don't have to know all the right answers. You don't have to have every single argument or every single thing right. But what you do have to have is the truth. Because the truth, and Pastor Terry preached about it last week, the importance of reading our Bible. It is one of the most important things we can do as Christians living this life. And this whole series called Foundations is about equipping you and setting you up for success in your walk with Jesus. That's what it's about. So we wanna make sure that you have the tools to be full every single week. And many of you actually walked into church and you looked like this. You looked like, you know, you were half empty 
and, and you had all these other thoughts and things inside of you, um, and you're just grasping onto anything that you can find because you need it, because you're not full. And I don't say that to condemn you, and we're going to get to that in a second, but I say that to let you know that if you are not full with God, you will be full with something else. You will have something to fill that God-sized void inside of you, and that's just the facts. All of us have a longing, have a yearning to have God living inside of us. And if you don't, if you've never made that decision, there will be something else filling that spot. The more we know the truth, the easier it is to submit our feelings to them. And that's the point I wanted to make with that illustration. And, and, and lastly, I wanna say this, our thoughts and our feelings, this is point number three, follow our habits. Our thoughts and our feelings follow our habits. Matthew 6, 21, well, probably one of the most quoted scriptures in the Bible. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we spend time with the world, if I spend five hours a day on Instagram and TikTok and, and, and lusting after all these girls that I see on the page, then, then when I go out in public, that's actually what my life is gonna look like because I've spent so much of my time developing these habits to do that out in the real world. Because my, my habits and my thoughts and my feelings follow my, my, my habits, okay? If, if I spend time at church, if I spend time in the word, if I spend time praising and worshiping, what's your life gonna look like? It's gonna look like what the Bible says it should. But, it, but if we spend time lying to people, if we, if we have a habit of, of hurting others, if we have a, have a habit of doing all those things, then our feelings are gonna follow those habits and say, eventually, hey, those things that you're doing are okay because, because that's where our feelings follow. A lot of us think that, that we just need to, to get rid of a habit, but we actually need to do is, is, is get rid of a, um, a, a behavior. This, hold on, this isn't making sense. I, I, I need to find the words to, to describe this to you, but many of us, like to do this in the opposite way. We want, to, we want to just fix like a certain problem in our life, but what we actually need to do is fix our heart. Because where our, or we need to fix our treasure. Because where our treasure is, there our heart will be. Our heart will follow our treasure. If my treasure is in Instagram, then, then, then my heart is gonna be on Instagram. It's gonna be like, hey, Austin, you need more likes. You need more, more interaction on your, you need more comments. You need all these things to be okay because that's what my feelings are telling me because that's where my treasure is. But if God is my treasure, then the only thing that I care about and my feelings care about is what God says about me. So God needs to be our treasure. So if there is something in your life that doesn't line up, ask yourself this question, what is my treasure? What am I looking to the most? What am I so focused on more than anything else in this life? And odds are your feelings and your thoughts and your habits are following that thing. This, we normally use this verse around tithing because um, when we invest our money, invest our finances into something, typically our, our actual emotional and spiritual investment follows that. Because our money is our treasure a lot of times. So, so if I invest into Hermes and Assembly financially, then, then I'm gonna care about what's happening inside these four walls because I'm invested in it. If I um, pay for a very expensive PS5 or iPad or something like that, then, then I'm gonna care about it because I've spent a lot of money investing in it. So I'm gonna put a nice screen protector on it. I'm gonna put it in a case. I'm gonna make sure it's always in my backpack. I'm not gonna give it to my daughter because she'll break it because I have invested in this thing and my thoughts and my feelings and my habits follow my treasure. And, and, and many of us, our treasure is just placed in the wrong things. And this is the battle, the battle between your feelings and following God that you will face your entire life. It is a constant war in your mind. 1 John 3 verse 23 says this, this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Now that actually sounds like another scripture I read before. When Jesus was asked what the, two greatest, or what the greatest commandment was, Jesus says, to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love others as yourself. And when, when, when John is quoting this in the book of 1 John, he actually kind of equates the two. They sound very similar. He says, we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. So it's almost as if he's saying, that, that to love God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind is to believe in him, and to believe in him is, is to love God with all of our heart, soul, strength, mind. and mind. And here's where I'm going with this, that, that the battle we are gonna face in this life, the hardest thing that we're gonna face is not the people that are opposing us as Christians, it's not the, the, the financial struggles we might have, it's not the, the jobs or the people in our life. The biggest struggle we are going to face as Christians is the struggle to actually believe, is the struggle to believe because because our belief is what drives our life. Our life goes in the direction of our strongest belief, 
of our strongest thought, of our strongest feeling, okay? That's why this war on feelings is so crazy because Satan knows that if he can control what we believe, then he already has us. If I can believe that God is a bad God and doesn't want anything good for my life, then he's won. But if I truly, truly believe who God is and what he wants to do in my life, then Satan has lost, okay? Let me prove this to you. It is very hard. Uh, one of God's greatest commandments for us is simply to believe in God, to believe that, that Jesus died in your place because many of us don't actually believe a lot of these things. For example, um, if you believe that you are worthless, then your thoughts and your feelings are probably gonna fall out. You're actually gonna begin to think that you're worthless. You're gonna, you're gonna begin to, to live like you're worthless. You're not gonna respect yourself. You're not gonna respect others because you believe that you're worthless. You know what's actually true though is that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God has given you identity. So even though you believe you're worthless and you believe that's true, it's false because the Bible tells you who you actually are and that you are full of value that Jesus paid a high price for you. Many of us, when we believe something, our heart and our mind follows that. If I believe that God actually wants to heal the sick, what should I do about it? I should go pray for sick people because God wants to heal them. But if I don't believe that, then, then I'm not gonna pray for sick people, right? Are you guys following what I'm saying? If I believe, if I have low self-esteem, even if it's not true, I'm gonna believe it. Somebody once said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right because your belief will determine the direction of your life. Whatever you think to be true is where you are going to follow. That is the path you are going to walk on. So if I believe that the Bible is true, that God is who he says he is, that I am who he says I am, then my life is going to look a lot like what the Bible talks about. But, but if I believe that, that, I am, that I am worthless, that, I am, that I'm not worth anybody, that, 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 that the things I do in my life are, are pointless, then, then my life is going to reflect that I'm never going to do anything important. I'm never going to have quality and, and, and deep relationships with anybody because it doesn't matter. Because what we believe will impact our life significantly. And here's the key. And, and if the worship team wants to come back up and, and join me on stage, we can uh, wrap it up. But here is the key to really making this happen. Because if, if our greatest challenge really is just to believe, then we need to know how to overcome that challenge. Because many of us, this is our greatest battle that we will fight. Number one, we have to understand the position that God has given us in his kingdom. Many of us don't actually know the benefits that we have when we become Christians. Okay, if we read on in that same passage where Paul says, the things that I want to do, I don't do, the things that, I, that are evil, I actually end up doing. If we read further on in that passage, Paul gives us the answer to this problem. Chapter eight, verse one says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your position is in Christ Jesus. Other place in the Bible says, you are hidden in Christ. So what this means what this means is that, that you actually have access to all the same things that Jesus had access to when he was here on this earth, okay? You don't have to follow your feelings. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. You have access to the same power that allowed Jesus to overcome his feelings and to follow God's plan for his life instead. But many of us, because we don't understand our position in God's kingdom and don't understand the benefits that it comes with, will never actually live like that. When we get a job, one of the first things we like to ask is, what are my benefits? Do I have insurance? Do I, do I have health care? Do, do I have dental? Do I have vision? Do I have all these things? Because we wanna know what we have access to. Many of us, don't know what we have access to right now in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, Paul says, there is no condemnation. There is now therefore no condemnation. If you follow your feelings and you trip up and fall, that's okay because there is no guilt. There is no shame. There is no condemnation for those who are hidden in Christ Jesus. And when you understand that you can do what Jesus did because you're hidden in Christ, when God sees you, he actually sees what Jesus did. When he sees you, and when you, when you have those things that Jesus had, you can begin to walk like Jesus walked. No longer do you have to submit to the thoughts and the feelings that are lying to you, but you say, you know what? Satan even tempted Jesus in the wilderness and, and tried to get him to think things that weren't true and believe things that weren't true. He said, turn this, this, this rock to stone. And, and, God, and Jesus said, man shall not live off bread alone because he knew the truth. Even though Satan was trying to convince him and lie to him, Jesus knew the truth. So when you're hidden in Christ, 
your life will look just like Jesus is. So that's one key to overcoming this challenge of our belief. Secondly, the last one is this. Many of us believe that, that what we believe and, and, and conjuring up all this faith inside of us is actually our own work. Maybe you had somebody said something to, to you like this. Um, you know, you've heard the Bible verse that says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. If you can say to this mountain, move and it'll move. And, and so you've tried, you've tried to say, mountain, get up and move because I, I, I have faith, but, but the mountain never moved. And so what you're left with is this bad theology that says, oh, you just don't have enough faith. You just don't believe enough. And what happens is we think that we have to conjure up more faith and more belief inside of us, but here's the problem, you can't. It is not your responsibility to, to convince you and to, to give you faith. What is so cool about the gospel and the good news is, is, is this idea that you can actually do nothing to believe it. Nobody comes to God the Father except if they are drawn by him. Believing in God, having faith, Something that you think you have to do on your own is not even your own work. There is nothing inside of you that can build enough faith to move a mountain and say move. It never will. Because what happens, this word for faith in the Greek, and I've shared this before, but this word for faith, it, it, it actually means to be persuaded. To be persuaded. Now many of us, like I said, we believe that we have to conjure up the faith inside of us, but what, what the word faith actually means is is God persuades us of what's true. He persuades us to believe in the things that he says are true. He persuades us to, to understand and believe that we can actually walk like Jesus walked. There's nothing you can do, so stop trying. Stop trying to conjure up the things inside of you because you never will. All you need to do is surrender to God and say, God, I'm feeling all these things, I'm having all these thoughts, and, and I really want to believe in you, but, but for some reason I just can't. I don't have enough faith inside of me in what the Holy Spirit does. In that moment when you surrender, when you say, you know what, God, I'm tired of following my feelings and following my own ways, I'm ready to follow you, the Holy Spirit comes onto you and says, God really does love you. God really does persuade you, and this is not something that makes sense in our brain. Let me tell you that this is supernatural. When God persuades you of who he really is, it just it passes your brain and goes straight to your heart. Because God really does love you and some of us don't believe it because we can't. But God will persuade you. He will break down that wall. He will break every chain. Every chain. He will persuade you that he does love you. So here's what I want to do. I just wanna give you guys an opportunity this morning. If you've been following your feelings, if you've been trying to do life your own way, and it just hasn't worked out for you. Um, I wanna pray for you, but I, but I wanna pray for another group as well. If you're sitting in this room and you've never said yes to Jesus and to become a Christian, I wanna give you an opportunity to do so. And, and, and maybe you've walked away from the faith before. Maybe you, you've walked away from Jesus. You said, I don't want anything to do with him, but today I wanna surrender. I'm tired of doing this on my own power because I can't. I wanna give you an opportunity to become a Christian today. So if I could have everybody bow their head and close their eyes. I'm gonna to count to three, and if you would like to receive the free gift of eternal life that Jesus has to offer, I want you to shoot a hand in the air for me. On the count of three, if you wanna become a Christian today, raise your hand, one, two, three. If that's you today, shoot a hand up in the air for me. Thank you. Would you guys all join me and repeat this prayer after me? God, we thank you for what you're doing to, oh, sorry, don't repeat that, here, repeat this. God, today I live for you. I give you my sin. I give you my wrongdoing. God, I don't want to follow my own way. I want to follow you. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for your free gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give, it a, give a hand for those who raised their hand today and, and made the decision to follow Jesus. And lastly, I just wanna pray for everybody today that, that you will win this battle of what you believe, of what you feel, because the Holy Spirit inside of you is empowering you to overcome. And this is nothing that you can do on your own. This is only something you can do with Jesus. So would you guys join me in prayer once again? God, we just thank you for what you're doing today. 
And God, I ask that you would empower each of us with your Holy Spirit this morning to really walk this thing out. God, we recognize and we surrender the things that we want to do. We surrender the things that we feel inside of us. We surrender the experiences that we have, God, and say, your will be done, not mine. So God, empower us this week in the name of Jesus.